All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Discovering Multifamily Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Anthony Scandariato with Red Knight Properties. And today we have a special guest here with us, Van Sturgeon, who has been around for a while. He's an experienced and successful real estate entrepreneur preneur for over 30 years. He's been in the business. He covers different types of real estate, uh, very focused on multifamily, though, but he's done land acquisition deals, development, you know, been involved in property management um, and construction and renovation is his forte. So that's what we're going to talk about primarily here. We hear a lot about the word, um, really a phrase now that the real estate industry uses called value add. And what does, ex what exactly does that mean? Um, my company, we buy properties where we can add value, uh, increase the expenses, uh, decrease the expenses, increase the income, how do we do that? So Van's going to kind of walk us through that process, um, what he's been experienced with. Um, he owns over about a thousand properties right now across uh, North America, and uh, he's you know passionate about helping both homeowners and real estate investors um, overcome the fears of renovations and rehabbing. A lot of people don't talk about this aspect. Uh, they just kind of overlook it. And there are ways that Van's going to talk about to make that process more efficient. So uh, really excited to have him on the show. And yeah, let's get into it, Van. So the ABCs of renovation, how are you? I'm uh, doing very well. I think I appreciate you. Uh, we've, we're going back and forth, but finally we are able to nail it down and talk. I've been looking forward to this. And yeah, like uh, I, I love the fact that you touched on the this, this uh, generalization out there, you know, recent times of the value add. I've been doing this for over 30 years. And it's sort of uh, it's a it's a term that's kicked around, but nobody really goes into the weeds associated with how to create that value add. What is that process? And it doesn't necessarily mean about blowing up through a bunch of money or throwing a bunch of money at a at a particular asset and you know improving the suites, uh, you know, doing common areas improvements. Of course, that's part of that. But also, it could be something along the lines of taking a property and rejigging it in terms of uh, if there's excess land, redeveloping that, or could be uh, identifying a better property manager, creating efficiencies within that, within that relationship where you're able to drive value, more value out of that property. So we as a real estate investor are constantly looking out for that, the, you know, those ugly ducklings, you know, those diamonds in a rough where we can, whether it's in a single family or multifamily space, and, and, and typically, uh, make an investment, find, uh, sort of throwing dollars at it to be able to raise dollars sufficient, uh, sufficient dollars out of that value out of that. So I love talking about that process, and uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah. So Van, uh, you primarily deal with multifamily, and so do we. What are some metrics you look at when you're, let's say, buying an existing Class C asset and you're trying to turn it into C plus or B minus or even B, um, and you're projecting rents? and you're looking at costs and you're looking at what you want to do to the property in order to get those rents, are there any, what type of financial metrics do you use in order to see, okay, is my return on cost, I guess that's probably one of them, return on cost worth it in order for me to make these investments? Or should I say, the hell with it, I can get organically a 10% rent increase as opposed to I'll probably get 15 if I put 10 grand into this unit, that's not worth it. So what, what are some of the things that you look at from that perspective? I love the fact that you brought that up because oftentimes I'm finding a lot of uh, real estate uh, investors on a multifamily side, syndicators, there's this, you know, this overheated real estate market that the margins are so tight in the, uh, when we're acquiring these properties that sometimes you're just better off not doing anything and just keeping the status quo and get that 10% perhaps bumped through organically versus you know, blowing your brains out on value add stuff, renovations and things of that nature. And then, you know, getting to a point where you're taking some risk associated with that investment. There is a process and system that I developed. I've literally done thousands of renovations, whether it's on my own properties. I got around right now, I got around 1200 or in relation to as a general contractor, that's how I got started in this business. My relationships with other prop, uh, other real estate investors, but I've done their, the, the, you know, the value add on their properties. It really, really boils down to and there's a system or process that needs to be implemented to be able to drive the best bang for your buck and really to drive the, the process forward to create uh, to create you know, meeting expectations and goals that you've established for that particular asset. 
So it starts really at the right from the get go and establishing a clear goal associated what it is that you're looking to accomplish within that that value add. Oftentimes, as real estate investors, in particular in a single family home side, is this is a generalization just this generalized approach toward yeah we we're going to flip the property or we're going to raise rents, but really isn't the point where an actual goal is spelled out associated what we're looking to accomplish. So in a particular in a multifamily space, typically we're looking to raise rents. And so that process, I, what I like to uh, engage people in is make sure like to identify exactly what it is that we're looking to raise rents by, and then going out in the marketplace and validating it, validate, validating it on a granular level. What that means, like what I, oftentimes we, we get caught up, you know, there's a lot of multiple things going on in that due diligence, you know, your number crunching phase associated with acquiring a property. And sometimes we just put generic numbers uh, toward that sweet renovation you know, and, and really not really fine tuning the numbers associated what it is exactly we're getting the biggest bang for our buck associated because we don't have unlimited dollars to throw at a project. So what I strongly encourage in engagements that I had with multifamily investors is to do a really in-depth market analysis associated what it is that the triggers that we need to incorporate within our particular renovation value add to generate the positive results associated with the goals we've established right from the get-go. So if it is we're raising rents by a couple hundred dollars, three hundred dollars, for example. We need to go on the marketplace and really see what those properties, comparable properties, have that ours does not. And you might do that in the do, you know, in your in your underwriting due diligence phase. But I really want folks to go in there and 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 look at comparable properties to see what it is that these properties have that your property does not. Smell the air. Look at the type of. Uh, paintwork there is, the type of flooring, the kitchen, the bathrooms, all of these types of things, the common area uh, areas, you know, the feelings you got, the lighting, all these elements you need to bring into your property to be able to uh, actually get to the point where you're validating a goal to be able to get to that goal and projections you have. And sometimes in that process, you you can find out some real nuggets. I, I've had some interactions with folks where they've been able through that process where I help them, they've been able to figure out that they don't have to blow their brains out on granite countertops of two, three thousand dollars per suite, uh, they can go around and get by with five hundred, six hundred dollar backsplash. And there's a savings right there over the course of 20, 30 units. That's significant dollars. But once you've gone through that process, you really have an understanding of what it is you're looking to, to do through uh, for that you know, for that asset in terms of that value add. Then, then you move on to uh, there's a process and. Really, ultimately, that process is being really assessing your property and creating a needs and wants list. Um, and what that for me, what that means is that we go through and do an inventory of the property. And on that big old list, we have one column that identifies needs, things that we have to do. So if there's a hole in the roof, there's a hole, there's a pothole in the driveway. Those are things that need to be addressed right away because it could cause harm to the structure or to the individuals, you know, the walking around. But then there's a want side where if there's monies toward our budget that we would put toward those types of improvements. So as much as we might hate the, you know, that lime green carpet from the 1980s that's in the, you know, in the common area hallways, if it's still serviceable, that's a want side, that, that's a want item that we put on that. If we have the dollars, we'll, be, we'll address. But if we don't, we're going to go after other items that will deliver the highest ROI. So we take care of the needs, but then we go into the wants. And that's where the experiences associated with you know, being involved in this business for so, so many years, I can I really I, I can merely tell what are the things that will do will hit certain, you know, will, will drive the, the best bang for your buck. You know, things like uh, exterior improvements associated with landscaping, uh, a coating of the parking uh, area, restriping it, uh, painting windows and doors. You know, those are some of the topical cosmetic improvements that you can do that will deliver the highest ROI if you have a limited budget. It's obvious, and of course, Anthony, that if we had, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars to pour into each individual suite improvement, that you will raise rents. But sometimes our budgets don't allow to do that. So you have to really be strategic in what are the things that will drive the highest dollars, get the best bang for your buck. And I help folks uh, go through that processes to be able to. Uh, make sure that they identify those items that deliver the best bang. So top, uh, typically it would be exterior stuff, for example. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. And when sponsors are underwriting, they're going through their underwriting process. They're not really getting bids from contractors or they think that their maintenance technician is just going to be able to do it all. And that's usually not the case sometimes. 
cer certain things. Um, and what are some ways sponsors can really do almost more due diligence? I mean, you know, you have a limited time to do due diligence as a sponsor. Typically, it's 30 days, 45 days. Sometimes it's even less now because the market's very competitive. So what's, what are some ways we can be more efficient as real estate investors during that period to really understand what our costs are going to be? And like you said, you know, there may be, you, you, we're usually not working off of unlimited funds or a large budget. Um, and sometimes the area doesn't call for top of the line finishes or the comps don't call for top of the line, but you, you pro projected that. And because you just you're just behind the computer and you don't really understand the market when you actually go, it's it's a little bit different. So uh, what are some ways they can up, you know, up front, try to figure out really it doesn't have to be 100 percent accurate. But even if it's 70 percent accurate, because I just see a lot of guys, oh, I'm just going to throw in uh, three to five thousand dollars a unit and that's going to be my ballpark. I mean, it, it could work when you but I, I typically don't. You know, I try to go in and break out line by line by line by line by line, you know, but you only have a certain amount of time to do that and a certain amount of resources. So what are some tips that you may have? Hey, you nailed it on the head. Like uh, it, it is a different ball game when you elevated yourself to the multifamily space where typically you're not using your own dollars. You're using investor dollars. And these are people that you've looked at them right in the eye and you said, hey, uh, invest with the invest in this project and we're going to. I'm going to deliver this, this, this. These are the goals. These are the projections. And then when you've come to that realization that the dollars you've allocated toward those types of improvements aren't either sufficient enough or you're not sure. Because so oftentimes I find that multifamily investors will reach out to one contractor, then reach out to another contractor to solve the same problem. But there's two series of, of actions that will be carried out completely different from one to the other to get you to the same goal. And so now you're in that unenviable position to determine now which direction to go and you're struggling with it. And uh, as I can provide tips, I can provide a bunch of things, but ultimately at the end of the day, nothing beats good old experience. This is the reason why, Anthony, you have been as successful as you have been. I have been as successful as I've been because we've put in through hard work and through mistakes and then uh, painful educations over a period of time, you've accumulated experiences, you know, to it, different types of transactions where you've accumulated a database of experiences that you can apply to every single project moving forward. And unfortunately, a new multifamily investor where everything is 10x in comparison to single family home investing are struggling with that. And I, one of the things that I strongly encourage folks is that you are in that due diligence phase that you are really seeking out expert opinion associated with, and I know it's a short period of time, but there, there are uh, professionals out there, whether they're structural engineers, uh, architects, individuals that you can bring into the fold to be able to really do an analysis associated with the costs of, uh, associated with these uh, these value adds that you're considering, and really validate this, uh, the dollars that you're putting uh, putting down as a budget toward these types of improvements. But really, at the end of the day, I. I love uh, you can get into hours of like things you should be looking for specifically to multifamily, but ultimately it comes down to trying to develop as many experiences as possible to be. And that's where you and I have that. Unfortunately, we have fortunately, unfortunately, we have that advantage versus others that are entering this space. Right. Yeah, sure. And that makes a lot of sense. And, and you know, what are some other avenues when the sponsor closes on the property and they're having a hard time managing the value add process with the contractors. Are there any programs or systems in place that, or they're losing track of their expenses or like maybe they don't need to renovate this one unit because it's in better shape um, than they thought and, but they still want to spend money there anyway. But like, is it, you know, managing the construction process, are there, is there any software that you recommend or what do you, how do you go about that to be well, more efficient? Yeah, in the, in the multifamily uh, space, uh, as part of that process that you've uh, identified your goal, you've got, you validated it, you have a needs and wants list created, then you move on into actually something that a lot of folks miss out on, especially in the single family home space, and is really creating a detailed scope of work associated with that value add, where you literally go in there and you identify the color of paint, the type of paint, the processes associated with paint, 
all of the finer details associated with that value add so that when you go out there to the marketplace to tender it out to contractors, you get quotes back that are apples to apples comparison versus the stuff that typically happens where it's just sort of the back of the envelope, you write things down that you want to see in this, this, in this value add or this, whatever this renovation scheme you're putting together, and you get all these numbers that come across, come out that are all over the place. So that's one of the things I'm a huge proponent on because in this space is a, I'm a general contractor. That's how I got started in this. And as a general contractor, if you go on a residential side, you hardly ever see anything like that. But on the commercial side, there are very detailed scopes of work created where there's drawings, there's pictures and specifications associated. And once you've established something like that, it's difficult to put it through, to develop one. But once you have that, then it's a boilerplate that you can use for other future acquisitions. Typically, you are operating within the same markets, uh, the same market, and usually you might be dealing with the same contractor. So, by virtue of having created that recipe, it's like you know, baking a cake. You need to have all those ingredients identified, this, the, the the amounts associated with them. It's just like uh, in, in just in renovations or doing a value add. You need to have that written down so that everybody is accountable uh, with what it is that you're looking to accomplish with that value add. Um, it is truly the key. Uh, oftentimes I find that in the multifamily space, right across the board, there's a failure in doing so. And that should be part of your processes in developing so that you keep everybody, all the partners uh, accountable, including yourself. It's really easy in, in this process you know, to start uh, ticking up the dollars associated with this, with this renovation value add. I mean, there's $100 toilets, there's $500 toilets, there's $10,000 toilets. And if you really aren't careful in that planning phase of creating a detailed scope of work, you, this, can, this thing can go in quickly, you can quickly over-renovate and blow your budgets. And all of a sudden you have, a, you know, you've got a, what's that called, a whale? And then you got, mm -hmm. you got a problem on your hands, right? Because you've got these investors expecting certain dollars that are going to be derived from this value add. And you kind of, and it's nothing worse than having to go back to investors and say, please give me more money. <laughs> we all want to avoid that, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, but I, unfortunately, I've seen that happen before, uh, particularly with over improving or, oh, I'll spend, you know, $20,000 on this unit. Our budget's 5000 for every unit. I don't think I need to do every unit. So I might overspend on maybe a few. And then you realize quickly, it's like, you know, actually the other units need to be done too, not $20,000 worth of improvements, maybe six, seven. Um, and that, but you blew it on a, a few units where you could have spent, you could have done medium grade finishes or medium grade upgrades and you would have been fine. Um, so I've seen over improved, improving assets, uh, particularly when it comes to units um, be cut, kind of a struggle for sponsors. And especially when, um, even like amenity centers, I've seen that kind of blow out of the budget's uh, waters uh, for sponsors. Um, you know, there's other thing, exterior uh, improvements in terms of landscaping, like you said, and some hardscaping and monument signage. We have stuff that we do. And to be honest, it's very inexpensive and it can change the whole dynamic of your property. And um, typically when we renovate or we go in to a new project, we're starting with the exteriors. Because that's good. that's the perception of your property, um, and that's how when your tenants first come up on site, if there's trash everywhere and the building's you know a crappy brown poop stain color and there's graffiti, they're just going to walk out. They're not even going to see the unit. So we usually start with the exterior, and like you said, there's certain little things you could do to you know clean it up from the beginning. Um, but when I see I see a lot of sponsors go a little bit over the top and they over improve when it's really not necessary and they don't get the rent bumps that they think they get the rent bumps they thought they were going to get, but it's eaten away because they're spending more money on CapEx. It, it is horrible. I've seen so many times, like you just mentioned, uh, property C-class properties where uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars are uh, poured into sweet improvements and common area. And, and all of a sudden you've got this, uh, you've got this beautifully renovated property, but as much as you might pump money into it, a C-class property, sometimes if you don't have the pools and the amenities and all that kind of stuff, you can blow your brains out as much as you want to renovating, unless you got able to figure out how to shoehorn a, a swimming pool in, a fitness center, or expand that unit from 700 to 1200 square feet. 
I don't care which, how much money money you spend, you're not going to be able to drive the rent up to that dollar value that you're looking for in your goals and projections. And so many times you find that in these inexperienced syndicators, investors, they walk in, they, uh, they just set aside a arbitrary dollar amount, $5,000, $7,000 to, towards suite improvements without actually going in and doing a real detailed market analysis. What is it that we're looking to accomplish with this property and what is realistic? As much as I might want to have lots of money, the unlimited sums of money to throw into some things, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get to the end goal of projection. So, uh, and that's, I find that often uh, that is the, uh, that is the issue. That's a problem. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and so basically but what you're saying is it comes down to experience and knowing what to look for, knowing how to deal with contractors, knowing you know who the good contractors are, and hopefully you're growing within the area where you started it. Sometimes that's not always the case. But like you said, I think the key you're mentioning is a template. Once you have your template, you can apply it to different markets and different properties and being able to grow at scale and be confident or at least more comfortable in your assumptions. So I really I, like I, that. Anthony, I uh, I struggle with uh, uh, with a lot of folks out there, uh, the real estate gurus that suggest that oh, you as as a sponsor, as a, is a primary guy to go in and put a deal together on a multifamily assets of 30, 50, 70 units is your first real estate investment. I I, I can't this, like it's like learning how to run before you even you know before you crawled. Like I think you need to cut your teeth on some smaller assets. And it can still be that four to five unit property, but you need to cut your teeth. You need to gain a, uh, some experience associated with that type of an asset and going through that whole renovation value add. And then you have some numbers, some experiences that you can apply toward that next uh, purchase that could be the 20, 30, 50 unit building. If you don't have that basis of experience, it's awfully hard, unless, unless you rely on an expert, somebody that can coach you or mentor you, a consultant that can step in, that can guide you through that. Unless you have that experience, you're up, uh, you're up a river without a without a paddle, I believe, because there's so many multiple moving parts during that due diligence phase, and and then you're closing a property from engineers, structural, all that stuff going on, and, and you got to verify rents, you got there's a lot of stuff going on, and you can slip up, and if you don't have that experience, um, yeah, so that's why I strongly encourage people to start down that single family home slash little small multifamily, cut your teeth on it, and then move up to the big show. And multifamily is 10x, baby. It's it's multiple things you better be aware of, or if not, you're gonna you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. And nothing worse than staring at an investor saying, Whoops, I need more money from you, or whoops, I, I you know, we're not gonna hit goals, or we're not gonna be able to meet disbursements on that quarterly basis. Can you imagine that? How having that a conversation? So yeah. I, uh, yeah, that's not good. So that's what I strongly encourage people uh, to make sure they, they know what they're doing. Absolutely, absolutely. Van, how can my audience find you? What's the best way to communicate? Oh, I, I, I love doing these podcasts. There's a bunch of information out there from uh, that, uh, that kind of stuff. But uh, I'm, I have a website, vansturgeon.com, where I have a wealth of information uh, of articles I've written and, and appearances I've done, have been on podcasts and videos I've created. So I really want to get out there and do as much as I can to clear up any issues or misconceptions also with this value add of how to approach it properly. So if you uh, have something that you're considering looking at doing and you need some guidance, by all means, reach out to me. I love, I love, how, I love this uh, part of the aspect of the business. So yeah, more welcome to reach out to me. Yeah, it's definitely fun. Uh, Van, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Really appreciate it. And for my audience, if you liked what you heard and or saw today, please give us a rating and review on iTunes. That helps Van and my message uh, reach a greater audience. That's just the way it works. So we really appreciate that and look forward to staying in touch with Van. And we'll have a link on our social media description to Van's website and other platforms that he just mentioned. So uh, look forward to staying in touch, Van. And thanks again. Thank you for having me. That is great.